time. <laughs> he also devotes extensive time to talking to the public in ways that they can understand and translate, uh, um, uh, explaining medical science to the public, uh, how they can understand it and translate this into a protective action, uh, which is obviously vitally important in avoiding and, and containing the spread of infection. Uh, while Dr. Fauci's many awards are a testament to his accomplishments, nothing speaks more powerfully than the millions of people around the world whose health has benefited from the work he's led, many of them matters of life and death. Anyway, he's a great role model for young people, and uh, it's a really, truly an honor to, to introduce you. Thank you very much, Edward. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all this evening and to share the program with Dr. Roman. It's really a great pleasure to have heard your remarks. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the biological sciences. You heard a really uh, very interesting and exciting projection of the future of one of the components of the physical sciences, but I'm going to talk to you about some of my experiences and the experiences that the uh, biomedical research community have had with some of the very important diseases. But since this is a program that is really devoted uh, to young people and getting their interest in science, I, I could not help but make this the title of my talk because I actually was one of those young people who was not really quite sure what I was going to do when I was growing up in the streets of New York, as I said, in this title. So let's start off with that and get to really what I want to talk about, about the excitement of the science. So I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in a neighborhood in Bensonhurst, which is very similar to the inner city of Washington, D.C. So when you talk about the students in the Washington, D.C. area, I, even though that was many, many years ago, I can relate very, very uh, closely to that. I went to a parochial elementary school, which looks now, I took a picture of the school, it's amazing, about 50 plus years ago, like, that looks exactly the same. <laughs> nothing, nothing has changed in the school. Uh, the old nuns are not there, but the, the school is still the same. Um, I was trained, interestingly, and this is, I think, a, uh, an interesting perspective of how things evolve in your life of which you have no control over. I went to a, a Jesuit high school in New York City, Manhattan, called Regis High School, which was very, very much steeped in the classics and in philosophy with enough science to get me interested in science, but I was very taken up with the whole issue of philosophy uh, and classics and the humanities because um, some of you who may have had the experience of schools like this, there was a heavy emphasis on Latin, Greek, uh, the romantic languages, and I always knew I really liked science, but I was very much drawn in by that. And the Jesuits in this school steered me in college to another Jesuit institution. Here's me by actually playing basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player. <laughs> but uh, when you are a 5'7 guard that's very fast and you are going against a 6'6 six, six guard who's very fast, the 6'6 six, six guard will always do much better than you. So I decided that as much as I loved it, uh, I went to, again, a classic uh, uh, humanities college, Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. And from there I developed a keen furthering of my interest in the classics, but also the first inkling that I also love science. And this has been a kind of a uh, uh, tension in my own personal life about the humanities versus the science, and I think that's the reason why I went into medicine because it, to me it gives you a, a glimpse of both. You're dealing with people, but you're also, as much as you want to, dealing with science. And it was that that brought me to medical school at the New York Hospital Colonial Medical Center in New York City. And there's a picture of me, you can't see it very well, of when I was an intern in medicine and did several years of training in medicine. And then things happen that are really not necessarily under your control, in order to get further academic training, I went down to the National Institutes of Health, which is just about five and a half miles north of here, in Bethesda, as a fellow in the discipline of infectious diseases. And this is a picture of one of our buildings at the National Institutes of Health. And 
Um, I got very much involved in fundamental basic science. And then, as a very classic example of how things beyond your control dramatically influence your life, I always had a broader issue of wanting to get involved in global health issues, even though I very much liked taking care of individual patients, and my primary identity was then, and still is now, as a physician, and I still see patients on our hospital ward at the NIH, even though I'm very much steeped in fundamental basic science and molecular biology and cellular biology. So again, that tension between the two has gone on decades after I first felt it when I was going to elementary school and high school. But then something happened that completely transformed my life uh, as a scientist and a physician. And that was something that landed on my desk in the summer of 1981, which was the first initial report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in June of 1981 of five gay men from Los Angeles who presented with a very unusual pneumonia that you only see in people who have com compromised immune systems. I thought it was a fluke. I put the, the, the publication aside. And then about one month almost to the day later, on the 4th of July of 1981, another publication came out now reporting 26 Curiously, only gay men, not only from Los Angeles, but now from San Francisco and New York City, who presented with an unusual type of an infection called pneumocystis pneumonia and a very unusual tumor called Kaposi sarcoma, again, that's only seen in individuals with very compromised immune system. And that actually changed my life because I decided at that point that as successful as I have been in the fundamental basic science, that I was going to make a major dramatic career change and start studying these individuals over a period of time who had a disease which when you talk about the unknown of science and why it's on the one hand very exciting, but on the other hand when you're dealing with science that relates to human beings, namely the biological science, I was taking care of people who were dying in front of me every day, and I had no idea what was wrong with them. I had no idea what the etiological agent was, because remember, I started seeing individuals <coughs> in 1981, and the virus was only discovered and proven to be the cause of AIDS, namely HIV, in 1983 and 1984. So here's a picture of me, uh, with no white hairs at the time, but this is what AIDS did to me over the years. And this was the darkest period of my medical and scientific career, because I can't explain how frustrating it is for a scientist who's devoted to saving lives and curing people when virtually everybody that you come into contact in your chosen discipline dies. And here's a picture of me making rounds on one of my patients in the early years of HIV, where the median survival was six to eight months, which means that 50% of all of your patients are dead in six to eight months. And that's a very depressing and sobering feeling for a physician. The reason I tell you this now is because what I'm going to say over the next several minutes is what the extraordinary power of science has done and how results in the biological sciences can show you things that are actually breathtaking. And I've had the opportunity, I would say the privilege, and, and also the pain that goes with it, of being there from the very beginning when you had no tools, and then by studying through the scientific method, a way to completely turn around a major catastrophic pandemic. And for those of you, and I can't imagine anybody doesn't know a little bit about what's going on with HIV, but if you look at the numbers, they're really astounding. It is clearly among the short list, less than a handful, of the most serious pandemics that we have ever experienced in the history of civilization. So currently, there are 34 million people living with HIV. 30 million people have already died from HIV. 30 million people. And we've only known about this disease for 31 and a half years. There are 2.5 million new infections a year and 1.7 million deaths. But despite that, the advances have truly been breathtaking. Right here in the United States, we don't think about it much, 
There's a little bit of a complacency. There have been over 600,000 cumulative deaths. In the United States, there are 1.1 million people living with HIV. Unfortunately, about 20% of them don't know that they are infected. And about 50% of all the new infections come from people who don't know that they are infected. And that, you know, I could spend the next half an hour on healthcare delivery. So you have a situation where the people who are infected don't know they're infected, and they are innocently going around infecting other people. So if you can only access them and get them into a healthcare system, test them, and put them on treatment, we know when you treat somebody and bring their virus down to below detectable level, they don't infect anybody. It's almost impossible for them to infect someone because the viral level is so low. So treatment is really a major form of prevention. The other thing that is, you know, feeds into my social consciousness because of what I was telling you why I gave that little introduction about where I came from with the humanities is that the health disparity is extraordinary. 12% of the population of the United States is African American and 55% of all the new infections among African Americans. 55% versus 12% of the population. Washington, D.C., believe it or not, I'm a jogger, so if I walked out here and jogged for four and a half minutes, I would be right here, whoops, right here. And that is where there are 3.1% of the people in that district are infected. 3.1% of everybody. Washington, D.C. is the highest prevalence of HIV infection in the country and has a prevalence that's higher than 20 Southern African countries. So when we think that we're immune to these kinds of issues here in the United States, we are not. Uh, and that's something that we are now putting a major effort in being able to access people, get them into testing and treat it, and also get them involved in prevention modalities. This slide I've entitled Presidents in HIV, and I've had the privilege over many years, right from the very beginning when we first recognized it, of dealing with presidents from Reagan to George H.W. Bush, and here he is visiting one of the AIDS wards at the NIH, and here I am, a, a Clinton, as many, many of you heard of, is a very wonky, intelligent guy, and he wanted to hear about the fundamental basic science, and I'm showing him one of the receptors for HIV in the cell, which he was very excited about more than anything else. George Bush, who we'll get back to in a moment, because he started one of the most important public health programs in the history of the country, and then currently, here I am visiting with uh, President uh, Obama, who, as you know, has a major interest in this also. So this summer, right here in Washington, D.C., we had the 19th International AIDS Conference. And one of the things that was striking about this conference, and it was antedated by uh, uh, Secretary, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who came to the NIH and said, based on the science that we've done, and she announced it at the NIH because she was insightful enough to realize that we've gotten to the point now where we can turn around this pandemic, literally turn the trajectory around. And the theme of the meeting was turning the tie together, and I had the opportunity of giving the opening keynote at that meeting and stressing what Secretary Clinton herself pointed out, that the end of HIV AIDS is built upon a foundation of fundamental basic and clinical science. We couldn't be doing anything we were doing with it without the fundamental basic and clinical science, which leads to the development of interventions, predominantly in the form of treatment and prevention, which then you must implement. So this is a very interesting cascade. You have the scientists working at the bench, the clinicians in the ward, providing the foundation to develop and implement uh, an intervention which is meaningless unless you implement it, particularly in the developing world, because 96% of all the infections are in low and middle income country, and 67% of all the infections are in southern Africa. So you talk about health disparities based on where you live, that's striking. So let's look at the basic science very briefly. Those dark years that I described, that picture of me back in 1981 in the summer, until 1984, we didn't even know what was the cause of this, and it was the discovery by the French in 1983 of identifying the virus, which in 1984 
Robert Gallagher and his colleagues at the NIH prove the etiological connection between the virus and the disease. <coughs> so it's a question of scientists working in synergy, making the first great breakthrough. The other thing that I can't resist telling you is that if you're not involved in science, you may not appreciate that you read in the newspapers about scientific breakthroughs, but most of science is incremental, and then you get a breakthrough. You don't get every discovery is a breakthrough. So the, clearly the discovery of the virus was a breakthrough, but then there were a lot of things that went on that was just slogging it out in the trenches, getting to where we are right now. One of them, and again, this may be a little confusing, this is a cell that gets infected by the virus. And one of the very logical stepwise approaches to developing therapy is that you look, the virus binds to the cell a certain receptor. We figured that out about a month after the virus was discovered. It enters the cell, it unloads its RNA, reverse transcribes into DNA, sticks itself into the chromosome of the cell, then transcribes messenger RNA to get a new virus. It's called the replication cycle. Now, why is that important, other than it's a very interesting scientific discovery and scientific observation? It's important because every one of these steps is vulnerable to intervention by a drug. So for every one of these steps, we've developed a series of drugs over the years that are now together can actually inhibit the virus in a way that was unprecedented because virus just replicated until it killed the individual during the years that I showed you on the picture. So these types of things lead to the interventions in the form of treatment and prevention. So let's just take a second and take a look at what's happened with regard to the treatment. Since 1987, when the first drug was discovered at the NIH and then developed by Burroughs Welcome, we've had a series of now more than 30 drugs, which when put in combination of three, has been among, in fact, this has been recognized by science and by nature and by all the journals, as clearly one of the major biomedical research breakthroughs in the history of medicine. We've taken a disease which was essentially 100% fatal and developed a series of drugs 30 years after you identify the agent, which completely turns around the course of the of an infected individual. So let me give you an example. Remember I told you that the median survival was six to eight months? Now, if that same patient walks into my hospital up in Bethesda, is 20 plus years old, and is newly infected, and I stop them on the triple combination of drug, I can project and mathematically model and look them in the eye and honestly tell them that if they take their medicine, they will live at least an additional 50 to 53 years, which would give them a normal lifespan. And we know that because there have been a number of studies here in the United States and in Europe and the developing world, and this is one from Hopkins, from my good friend John Bartlett, in which they looked at, this, at the cohort in Baltimore, 28,000 patient years of follow-up, there was a longevity that is now more than 73 years of age. So it isn't a cure, they still have to take the medication, but that is what's called a scientific breakthrough. But it came around by incrementally understanding the virus and the developing of drugs. Prevention is the same thing. There are multiple combinations of prevention from low-tech things, like <coughs> behavioral modification, use of condoms, education, counseling, to biologically, one, like microbicides and prevention of mother to child transmission, to the development of a vaccine, which is still the holy grail of AIDS research. Now comes the implementation, and here's where science and policy come together. And this, if, when people ask me what is the thing that I'm probably most proud of, of the things that I've done over my career, it really relates to what we call the birth of PEPFAR, which is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief that some of you may have heard of. It is a very important program. And how it started was that President Bush asked me and Tommy Thompson back in 1982 to go to Africa and visit a bunch of countries to determine if we could put together a feasible program that could save the lives of people in the developing world 
because he felt a very strong conviction that those of us here in the United States who are a wealthy country have an obligation to people who are suffering in a lesser country. So we went there and I spent a few months working with the people there to see if we could put together a feasible program. Here's a picture of me with a young 18-year-old girl who with the very little money that they had at the time was actually delivering drugs in the bush because people here in Washington, some of them in this building, didn't believe that you could actually get Africans to take drugs every single day, three times a day. So we went into the bush with them, and here she is on her motorcycle, and this little box here is the medications that she's delivering into the village. I was following her in a Land Rover. She wanted me to go on the bike with her, but I decided it wasn't a good idea, so I drove in the car. And we visited a number of villages. Here we are in the village. Four out of the children in this group, in the picture with me, were infected. And they were getting treatment that was being delivered by this individual. Finally, after eight months of working, I came up with a model that I convinced the president and his staff, and I give great credit to his staff at the time, who accepted the idea that we would have a $15 billion five-year program to treat 2 million people, prevent 7 million infections, and to care for 10 million people. And now, 10 years later, the program has expanded to approximately 18 to 20 billion dollars over a period instead of the 15. So we're spending about 5 billion a year right now on, on, on. The results have really been striking because it's really a save now of at least 5 million lives the program has saved. Uh, based on the ability to get drugs to individuals. So here are the results. I showed you that before. Since 2001, there's been a 22% decrease in new infections and a 24% decrease in deaths due to HIV. Hillary Clinton, on World AIDS Day a few months ago, in December of 2012, came out with what's called the PEPFAR blueprint about how you can now use the basic science, the interventions, and the implementations to completely turn around the trajectory of the pandemic. And, I, and she's absolutely correct that if you look at the trajectory, it's starting to go down, and it's going to go down even more. So that, again, to reemphasize the purpose of what we're talking about this evening, it's all related to the fundamental basic and clinical research which allowed these prevention and treatments to occur, which allowed us to be able to implement them through the PEPFAR program. So finally, in the last minute or two, we, we figured it out, we being the field, that if we did it with HIV AIDS, we could probably do it with other diseases of global health importance. I wrote a commentary 12, it's been now 12 years ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association to use the AIDS research model because of its implication for other infectious diseases of global health importance. So when we went to Africa, in a somewhat unidimensional way, and said, well, we can really do something that we did with HIV AIDS, we found out something that we probably already should have known, that there are many other things that are killing a lot of people in the developing world besides HIV, such as malaria, tuberculosis, and neglected tropical diseases. So the same sorts of programs now, the intensive science that's being put into tuberculosis and malaria in the next decade or so, we believe is going to have the same impact as HIV. And then finally, there are emerging infectious diseases that we never heard of before. Remember, HIV <coughs> is an emerging infectious disease. It could be anything from multiple drug resistant tuberculosis to pandemic influenza. Those of you who maybe are following this in the newspaper about the H7N9 influenza. Well, what do you think I'm doing with myself when I'm not talking to you? So the fact is that's another threat. Is it going to go anywhere? We don't know, but we've got to be prepared for it. And that's the reason why when I, I put this together again just a, a few years ago, when you talk about infectious diseases, you talk about the perpetual challenge. And since it's a perpetual challenge, uh, myself and my colleagues and the people I work with are not going to be here forever. And that to me is the message of what you guys are all talking about, about training young people. Because 
you can't just have people who get in a situation, do a job, and leave. You've got to have the next generation. So if you're going to be talking about the things that are ahead, the future, which are always surprises. Remember, when I went to medical school, I couldn't have imagined in my wildest dreams that there would be HIV AIDS or pandemic influenza. And it's for that reason why we need to nurture us very, very carefully the people who are going to be carrying the banner over the next several decades. Thank you. Hello. 
Irish encouragement and support, um, I wouldn't have uh, really got going in this. And we really were partners at the beginning. Uh, Larry had other things to do. <laughs> I'm obsessive, and I just kept going on. <laughs> Mine's for tokens. Yes, just lift up the top. Lift up. Oh my God. <laughs> Harold said I do not want to get an award at this ceremony, uh, so we, we got a little token. Uh, Harold's very good with plants, so uh, this is a bonsai tree. I'm not so good with plants, so I'm not. This got postponed a month. I've been definitely worried about this. <laughs> I mean, I've been treating it like a baby. I, I carry it out each day to get some sunlight. I spray it. <laughs> Your responsibility. Your responsibility. Well, thank you very much. I'm very Um, if it's possible um, for uh, Dr. Roman, Dr. Uh, both uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Roman to take a few questions, we're going to adjourn. But if you want to come up afterwards, uh, because we uh, we said we adjourn at, at seven, and I'll set up the uh, the show for the public. And, uh, and I want to I want to thank uh, Lou Mendelson, uh, Lindy Schreckengast, and Eva Jacobs. And there's Andrew Ruffin here. Andrew Ruffin handled all the interaction with the Senate Rules Committee for last tonight. So thank, thanks to those who made it happen. Thanks to you, Kane. Thanks to our volunteers. And, um, and many, many thanks to all those who support hands on science education uh, for young students. Well, uh, yeah, we, you can ask, we are, but we're going to adjourn, but ask one question. It well, better be incisive. Well, it's probably not, <laughs> but it's for Dr. Roman. Um, I could never figure out how we could tell what was going on in creation. By looking in the sky, and we can see what was happening zillions of years ago. How did you do that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. is about 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. And we can actually see things that 13 billion years. How does that happen? What do you mean, how does it happen? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can see 13 billion years. Well, what you're doing is looking at things that, that the light left them, left the things we're looking at, 13 billion years. It's still there. We don't know if it's still there. But we look at the light. The light's still there. But the object can't very well know. No, we can't tell what happened to it. So all we can say is there's one question. What's the one question? We can see what the light tells us that it was 13 billion years. That's all we can tell. I know that Dr. Fauci is going to remain for some questions as well. And do you want to see the pictures that I brought? Yes. You got pictures? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. I wonder if the Dr. Fauci would let me use the laser.
universe. But what it is is a, is a collection of dust and gas, mostly gas. And in places, stars are forming. And where the stars, the stars forming, which I don't say, it, the star protects the material beyond it. So it isn't evaporated. The rest of the material is open to the space sky, open to other stars, is gradually evaporating. So what you have here is a pillar of material protected by this new star starting out and causing coming down to other pillars that are beginning to be protected. When the stars, well, that's where stars start. When stars get very old, uh, they expand and they throw off a lot of their material. The sun's going to lose about half the material that it's made of now, eventually. It's going to get big. It's going to get big enough to, to engulf the Earth, possibly even Mars. And so when it gets that big, it doesn't have much gravity left at the, circle, at the surface, and the material just um, evaporates. Um, there, the so-called planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets, um, come in a large number of shapes and sizes. I think this is one of the prettier ones. When a big star, that's a star like the sun that we just saw, but when a very big star um, gets old, doesn't have any more fuel in the center to keep it hot, keep the center warm, and, and using more material, it collapses. And it collapses so fast that it explodes. And it throws its, it, almost all of its material back into space, uh, ends up with a white bar for a black hole. Uh, and this is some of the material that was thrown out by a star in one of these explosions. This is a galaxy. But it's not a normal galaxy because, as you can see, the <coughs> arms here are much more pronounced and drawn out than they would be in, say, the Milky Way or the Andromeda galaxy. But this is a case where there is another little galaxy nearby, probably this one, that is distorting the main galaxy. Thank you. And finally, I think fine. No, this is not fine. Right? This is. This is called the Hubble Deep Field. I was asked about things that are back where the light left them very early in the universe. This is a picture of, of an area, about, as I say, about a tenth the size of the full moon. And there are probably a half a dozen stars in this picture. I, I can't, I'm not sure. Well, at the moment, I can't find them. They're, they're pretty hard to find. I certainly couldn't even them. Best picture, I can't find six of them, but I have a feeling they're probably that many. There are 3,000 galaxies. And some of these galaxies, we are seeing the light that left the galaxy 12 billion years ago. So that's how we know, like, one of the ways that we know how things started early in the universe. And finally, I just threw one last slide in that I just happened to see recently. Well, maybe I didn't, I thought I. I thought I'd put it on here. Maybe I didn't. Well, never mind. <laughs> I, I, I had an interesting one that I thought I'd add it, but I apparently didn't. So I got
Yeah. 